ITR boxing. You heard it here first. Pretty cool videos. And I heard they're also in HD. ITRboxing.com. Three, two, one. I'm here with the <laughs> monster, Andrew Maloney, badass fighter. How, tell me about, break down what a hotel quarantine is like coming back from America and getting stuck in the hotel quarantine. Uh, g'day, Luke. Thanks for having me, mate. Um, yeah, so we've got a mandatory hotel quarantine here in Australia because of the whole COVID situation, obviously. So when we arrive back in Australia, um, you've got to go straight from the airport, uh, escorted by uh, police to a hotel quarantine centre or ho hotel. Um, and basically you get shut in your room for two weeks and you get tested a few times throughout those uh, 14 days to make sure that you don't have COVID. And after 14 days, if you're COVID free, you're allowed to go home. Well, that sounds like a hell of an experience after like the fight you just had where it's like you to me and this is me putting my own thing into it. It felt like this fight was so much about sacrifice for yourself. You sacrificed a lot to get that fight and then going home. I feel like the treat would be seeing your family and then you have to sit in a hotel room for two extra weeks. Yeah, that's spot on. I've um, spent a lot of time away from my family this year and you know, they, they would love to be able to come over and watch me fight as well. Um, and I'd love them to be there, but that's obviously not possible at the moment. But I had to go over to America twice this year and, and spent five months away from them. And then you're right, the, I was just hanging, especially when you land in Australia on the flight. You land in Australia and you're just, you know, so used to just going straight home to your family and it's a really strange feeling to then know you still got two weeks before you can see them. So it's been a very slow two weeks. Uh, I've got five days left now, so I'm almost there. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're probably pretty good with Netflix shows by now. Like you probably got a couple of go-tos or something or really good at push-ups or something. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the TV in our hotel room, the Netflix doesn't work. So I've been watching a little bit on my laptop, but it's just not the same. But uh, yeah, been doing some push-ups. We've got some dumbbells delivered and trying to do a bit of training while we're in here just to kill some time. So a big thing for me that I saw for this second fight was I have to ask about the camp and the sparring because it just felt like you were a different man the second time. I don't know if it was fighting in America for the first time. If that was, I always think that be, me being a European who moved to America, I think that's a big deal fighting somewhere you're not used to but you just looked like a different fighter. So I want to start with what was the camp, what was the difference in this camp? Um, it's hard to put, put my finger on it. Like, I think it was more coming off that loss and the fact that I didn't perform at my best in that first fight, that was the big difference between the first, you know, the, the two fights. One, I wasn't at my best. And then two, the, the loss really lit a fire inside of me and just made me so determined to, to come into the rematch in the best shape of my life. And, and I believe boxing better than ever. Uh, I made some huge improvements over those five months because I was just so determined to win that fight that I looked over that first fight and looked over everything I'd been doing and just tried to correct all the little mistakes and just try and do everything better. And I made some massive improvements in those five months. And as you could see in those, the two rounds of that fight, I was a completely different fighter, as you said, and I was dominating the fight. One thing that stood out to me was you're throwing a hundred punches around. I know for the average person, that probably doesn't mean a thing for me. I go, Oh my God, you're in really good shape because that is so tiring to throw a hundred punches around to me, that felt like, I don't know if it's the loss or your family, but you have to be driven by something beyond yourself to be able to be in that sick of shape, to be throwing a hundred punches around. Yeah, no, you're right. And after that loss, that's something that I realized, like losing my belt and losing my, my first fight with top rank in America, I felt like I'd let a lot of people down and those few days that in between like I didn't realize that we're going to have a rematch straight away and there's a few days in between that that 
I was thinking to myself, like, where do I go from here? Like, it's probably going to be a long road back. And um, I've got a young family that I need to, you know, support. And I've got nothing else other than boxing. So I, I knew that I need to make this work and I need to win this rematch more than anything. Otherwise, my career is going to take a real big hit, a real big setback. And yeah, I was fighting for my family and our future because I knew that I needed to win that fight. Well, and I think that you made me think about something I didn't even think about. You signed with Top Rank. You're hot. We're not going to use a cuss word, hot-ish out there. You're, you're the big thing, right? You're, you're coming in. There's a press release. It's you and your brother. Be on the lookout. They're badass fighters. And then you lose a fight. And then you see people go, well, you start to hear that doubt. Or people go, well, we're not all the way in. And I never thought about that. But that must be kind of mentally challenging for a fighter, knowing how talented you are. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of ripped me off after that first fight and just thought, oh, he's just an, a, another Australian fighter that's, you know, build a record back home and come over here and he's not going to make it. And I was so determined to show that that's not who I am and I'm, I'm a much better fighter than I showed in that first fight. And I got to show a glimpse of that in the second fight, but unfortunately... The way things ended, I didn't get my belt back and the fans only really got to see two rounds of me. Um, so now we start to get ready for the third fight and, and make sure that I do that again. Well, I feel like you're the ultimate chip on the shoulder guy. Like you don't need extra motivation and it's a problem for your opponents if you have any. Like I feel like you're a bad guy to trash talk because you'll take that into the gym with you. You're a bad guy to to have controversy happen because you'll take that into the gym. Any any thing that's against you, you're gonna live with. So I I personally talking with you, I expect you to be above and beyond because I think you're most dangerous when you're most motivated by uh, criticism. Yeah, you're right. And funny that you touched on that. I've actually never said this in an interview, but one thing with me as a fighter, I believe you can talk as much trash before the fight, even during the fight as you want, but after the bell rings, you've got to show respect. And after that first fight with Franco, he came over to my corner at the end of the fight and said, easy work to me. And that really pissed me off. And he shouldn't have said that because those five months in between the two fights every day in the gym that was playing over my head that I just wanted to get him back for that so that it was almost like a movie like you were every day when you got tired you were hearing easy work in your head from him and you never wanted to feel that again yeah I just was determined to show him that I'm not easy work I'm I'm no walkover for anyone and I wanted to get revenge so obviously I'm not going to spend much time on talking about what happened because listen everybody's been talking about that decision for you I understand it sucks like it's just it's not fun to talk about but how did you stay so composed and professional with all that was going on with now knowing that he had said that in the corner how did you stay calm for 30 minutes not knowing what the heck's happening um, well, I suppose for those 30 minutes while we waited in the ring, I was really confident that the decision was going to go my way because everyone who was watching the replays was sort of saying to me in the ring, it was a punch. There's, there's no head clash. It was a punch. So, which I knew. And I'm thinking, well, they're watching a replay. Surely this is going to go my way. Um, so... It was easy to stay calm in the 30 minutes, but afterwards, maybe not so much. Yeah, I mean, just I'm a very planned person. So like anything with indecision, it's like that would drive me nuts. Like I just I make your decision. I can't just sit here and have people looking at something for a long time. It would just drive me nuts. Yeah. Um, at that point, I was so confident they were going to overturn it that I'm just thinking, hurry up and announce me as the winner. So I can celebrate, like you, you reckon my moment. Um, but in the end, I didn't get my moment at all. So, do you That's remember it. the punch that did it? Yep, 100%. I remember throwing it in the fight, landing the jab, and then seeing his eye swell up immediately afterwards. 
And I've watched the footage back now a few times. Um, and I can pick, I know the exact punch it is. And I remember it during the fight. And if you actually watch the footage, you can see him covering his, his, his right eye with his right hand for about 15 seconds afterwards because he knows that there's been some damage done. And, and then since then, we've obviously got even more camera angles than what was shown on the TV coverage um, that are slowed down. And uh, yeah, it's, it couldn't be any more clear. Once you see the footage, it's, it's black and white that it's from a punch. So from the first fight to the second fight, did your sparring at all change? for that camp did you bring in different people or were you mostly sparring i'm gonna assume and this could make me sound dumb were you mostly sparring your brother um for the first fight i was i did a lot of sparring with my brother because there was sort of covid restrictions and um it was just sort of us two in the gym and we're doing a bit of sparring with each other and then we came over to america and i think we had five weeks before the fight so we got some some more sparring partners in um and I got some some good sparring for you know those four or five weeks, but it was still quite a short prep. Um, whereas the second fight, I was sparring for a, a good maybe four, three and a half, four months, and I organised six different sparring partners in America. We had some really good sparring in Australia before coming over, and then had six different guys in America that I could work with, and they were all very similar to Joshua, uh, to Franco. And um, yeah, couldn't have been any better. The, the preparation was absolutely perfect. So got to look now at, at possibly getting some of those guys maybe over to Australia um, or working out what we're going to do for the next camp because I don't want to change too much from what we did for that fight. And now, like, obviously, it like hypothetically, let's say Teofimo and George fight and then you're – you're either on that card or a similar card. I don't know the details. I just know that you guys are going to be fighting in Australia. It's a trilogy. I know you're going to be motivated, but what, first off, as an outsider to Australia, a guy that when I set up this interview, I set it up for Perth time, and I didn't know that there was a difference between Sydney to Perth. That tells you how Australian educated I am. Explain to me what moment this is for Australian boxing, and also, I guess it's two questions, but F it, I'm going to run with it. How being able to end this rivalry in Australia, if you're victorious, what that would mean to you in Australian boxing. Yeah, I'll start with that part. So that'd be just like a dream come true for me, honestly, like after losing the world title, then after what happened in that second fight and then taking the title away from me, then to finally get it back in Australia in front of my friends and family um, and putting on a huge event in Australia, um, it'd just be yeah so special, and it'd make all of this that we've gone through worth it. And yeah, it's uh, thinking about it just is crazy. Um, and I just really hope we can make it happen because it'd be a dream come true. Um, you... And then second part of the sorry to cut you off, second oh, no part worries. the like if if we we we're going to plan to do this uh, event in Australia with myself and my brother, even if the TFMO fight and uh, George doesn't happen. But if it does happen, if we can have TFMO Lopez come out to Australia and fight George, myself and Franco, my brother in another big fight on the same card, and then possibly some of the other rising stars in Australia. Um, I know Bob mentioned Tim Zhu possibly on the card. If we can put on that sort of event in Australia, It'll just be massive for the sport and huge for Australian boxing. And everyone around the world would tune into that event because that's just a massive stack card. And everyone around the world would see that Australia does have a lot of talent and, you know, really help put us back on the map because Australian boxing at the moment isn't really looked at as they don't see the talent that we have. Um, a lot of the time guys come overseas you know and they're sort of thrown in as an opponent and on short notice and things like that and and you know and lose and people probably look at us like we're you know b level but we were you know a card like that for us to really showcase australian boxing and put on a huge event um 
it'd be massive for the sport and really help grow the sport of boxing in Australia. Well, me being the big old softy too, I want to add one thing that I think would be special. I think that young kids who live in Australia, it would mean a lot to them to be able to see a bunch of really, really good Australian fighters where they could realistically go to a gym or see you in person and go, there's that guy I saw on TV. I think that that's what also grows the sport is just young children thinking it's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, you're right. That event would definitely do that. And, and that's something that myself and my brother are really trying to do is, is when we come over, you know, go overseas to America and, and fight on the big stage, make sure that we win these fights to, to show the up and coming fighters in Australia that it is possible to, to go over to the Mecca of boxing, fight in America on the big stage and be successful and win, win titles and, and win big fights. Um, because a lot of the time people over in Australia, they look at, you know, boxing in America and it just seems like it's so far away and, you know, impossible to achieve something like that. But we want to set, you know, set the trend and, and show them that it is possible and, you know, to, yeah, to help pave the way for the next generation. Well, there, I once read, I forget where I got this quote, but it's a great quote. And I'm sure it's from like a fight or something, but it was Socrates once told the story of a, a fish getting pulled up by a man's hand and then like seeing the world. And then he goes back to the pond and he tells all of his friends, Hey, this guy picked me up with his hand showed me the rest of this world. And everyone's like, oh, you're lying. And I always think about that when you're talking about, because that, what you're saying is to me that you're going out and you're trying to do something incredible to do it for bigger than yourself. And a lot of people wouldn't believe it's possible because it's not, they don't see it right now, but you believe that you're going to be the spark that creates change that will one day people go, oh yeah, that's totally doable. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Um, and all it takes is one person to do it. Like I know um, watching, watching Jeff Horn beat Manny Pacquiao in Australia, I know there's, there was a little bit of controversy around it. Um, people in America mainly and Philippines probably don't think Jeff won, but to me, he won the fight. And that, that really, you know, was the same sort of thing for me. I, I was on the Australian team with Jeff and had known him for years. And to see him take out a legend like that, it really made me think, you know, this, this is possible. You, you can achieve these huge dreams if you just believe in yourself and give it everything you got. What was that moment like for you to see someone you know beat this legend Manny Pacquiao? Yeah, it was crazy. There was like 60,000 people or something in the stadium and an amazing event. And then, yeah, to watch Jeff just fight, an unbelievable fight in my opinion. And and beat an absolute legend of the sport. It was, um, yeah, a crazy moment. Oh, uh, yeah, it was unreal. I think that the, because I thought Jeff won that fight too, and I'll go to my deathbed on that one. I'm just being fair. Like if I didn't, I wouldn't, I'd tell you my honest opinion. But I think yeah. Teddy Atlas really swayed a lot of people being on the broadcast and immediately kind of downplaying Jeff's win. I think that kind of hurt the win was when someone that's broadcasting the fights, like he actually didn't win because people don't know yeah. what they're watching. Most people don't understand boxing. Yeah, you're yeah, absolutely correct. And that's what the com commentators can do. They can really persuade the audience so much because you're right. A lot of people watching don't really know how to score a fight or don't really know how the, how boxing works at all. And, and they listen to someone, especially carry on the way Teddy did. And they think, oh, yeah, he's been ripped off. Jeff didn't win. But I'm 100% with you. It, not just because I'm Australian, but I watch that fight as, you know, fighter A versus fighter B, and you don't put this big thing around Manny Pacquiao and automatically think he's going to win the fight, which is what I think a lot of people did. Um, and I believe Jeff won that. Well, and, and not to make this the Jeff Horn podcast, but you can't just look at the best round of the fight for Manny Pacquiao and score that disproportionately as a win for the, like he had the most dominant round. It was like round nine or seven. Yeah. Have to go back. He had one round where it was super dominant, but you don't discount every other round based off one good round for Pacquiao. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It was round nine and yeah, you're spot on. It's just, it's so I got to ask you, knowing what I know about you, loyalty, your brother being self-motivated. Is there a part of you 
I know it's a different weight class, but you're the monster. There's another monster. Is there a part of you that wants a little get back for your brother? A little bit, a little <laughs> bit, but, um, and I'll look, I'd take that fight if it was presented to me, of course. But um, I think his, his plan is going to be to to become undisputed champion at Bantamweight and then probably move up. Um, at the moment, all I'm thinking about is firstly beating Joshua Franco, but I'm, I'm happy at super flyweight. I want to stay there for, for my whole career if I can and look at winning world titles there and becoming unified and, and ultimate goal becoming undisputed champion myself at super flyweight. So it's not a fight I think will happen, but yeah, it would be a, a good feeling to getting back. That's for sure. So I just, as I talk to you, I feel like you're the type of person where it's like, you want, you want to be motivated in the gym. And I know that that would be that motivation, but the, you make a lot of sense. The weight classes just don't kind of work anymore. He's just not in your weight class anymore. Yeah, that's right. And, at the moment, yeah, my, my motivation is winning world titles at super flyweight and, and staying there. Like a lot of people these days seem to want to move through the weight divisions and become two weight champion or three weight champion. But to me, I think it's more special and something I'd rather do would be stay at super flyweight and become unified or undisputed champion there. So you're like Bernard Hopkins or uh, Marvin Hagler or Gennady Golovkin, you want to just hold down a division and say, I'm the guy, you want to be the guy, come fight me. Yeah, that's it. I'd rather be the king of the super flyweight division and be recognized as the number one in that division. So outside of yourself, outside of Franco, who do you think right now is the the guy in super flyweight? When you look around and you think poses one of the biggest challenges or has the most accolades or should deserve the most respect? Um, I think it sounds like this fight is going to happen soon where Chocolatito fights Estrada. Um, whoever wins that fight is would be considered the number one, in my opinion. Um, and it's an interesting fight. I'm not sure which way that's going to go. Um, before their last fights, I would have said Estrada, but I don't think he looked as good in his last fight as he has previously. And I'm starting to think Chocolatito might beat him again. He ate a lot of punches, man. And I don't like seeing people take punches. And it looked, I don't want to throw a label on, but it looked like his skill set might be coming down the mountain. Estrada. Yeah, yeah. well, he's, he's had some hard fights over the years. And yeah, I expected him to have a pretty easy night with Quadras. Um, Quadras has looked not great in his last few fights before that. And I expected him to, to stop him early end up having a very hard fight over the uh stopped him in the last round was it i believe it was 11 some, or 12 i think 11 or 12 to be honest with you and this yeah. is going to sound so bad being a boxing interview guy it was one of those fights where i lost interest in it because it was like the skill was going out the window and they were just kind of hitting each other and i'm like ah, i can just watch the highlight video like this is just they're just <laughs> taking damage like there's nothing that i have to dissect here they're just hitting each other it's a will fight it looked mm -hmm. almost like early level, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but it looked almost at a certain point like novice level, open level amateurs because they were just trading too much. Yeah, no, I agree. I watched that fight um, and it gave me a lot of confidence. Um, obviously, I, I do believe in myself, but watching that, I thought, I can beat this guy 100%. Um, so, yeah, look, hopefully those fights, I can be involved in those fights in the future. Um, at the moment, it's Franco that my eyes are on and my focus is on, but I'd love to, to, uh, to take on the Estradas and the Chocolatitos and the, the other top guys in the division. Um, it's a stacked division at the moment. We've got Anka Haas, Ioka and Tanaka are fighting for the title on New Year's Eve. Um, Rungvisai is still around the division. So there's some huge fights in, in at super flyweight. And that's why I want to stay in this division and, and um, be involved in those huge fights and to ultimately become the number one. I feel like Rungvisai is the guy no one wants to fight. And I'm going to put a caveat. It's not because of the skill sets, because he doesn't speak English and he doesn't sell fights. 
So if you're in a fight with Rung Vasai, he's just going to get to show up, cut weight, and then you have to do every interview because everyone's going to be like, hey, you know what? We're not going to really, we don't really need that. So he has this major advantage over every American or every English speaking fighter because like he does not have to do any interviews. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that. I think you're right. Uh, if, uh, if we ever fight, I might have to say I can't speak English and get out of the interviews as well. <laughs> So I literally, I forget what fight it was at, but like he did his media workout and he literally just got to leave. Like, it's like, yeah, there's no questions for you. And then the next guy came and they're like, everyone swarmed. I'm like, what an advantage. Yeah. You know? yeah, true. It's funny, actually, before my last fight, myself and my twin brother, Jason, fought two weeks apart and he was taking on Anui. So a huge fight. And he had so much media attention before that fight and was doing interviews all day long. And I was coming off a loss and it seemed like no one cared about me anymore. I had no interviews before the fight, which was, which was great in a way, but it's just funny that he, uh, he was getting pumped for interviews before the fight. I had none. And now the things are sort of reversed. He takes a loss and hasn't really had anyone reaching out to him and everyone wants to speak to me after the controversy. So it's funny how things change around pretty quickly in this sport. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I didn't even know I could get a hold of y'all. So I didn't even bother with either of y'all before. And then I was just thinking, because I was thinking, who's some interesting thing I people I could get? And I was like, oh, but now I'll know when your brother fights again, I'm definitely going to interview him instead of you because he's coming <laughs> off the loss. So I, I can sprinkle that up. But it is crazy. <laughs> Do you have any observations? Obviously, the fight did, with your brother Jason didn't go the way you guys would have wanted with Inouye, but did you take away any observations as a fighter from what Inouye did in that fight? Or did you see anything maybe, because I know a lot of fight fans like hearing fighters perspectives to a fighter. Did you get, did you see anything about him that stood out? I did actually. And it actually, I took a few things from him and bring, you know, worked on them for the last two weeks before my fight, because his, his speed, firstly, was the thing that really stood out and was impressive. Um, I think that's where he generates most of his power is just from explosive speed. Um, secondly, his, his judgment of distance and the way he controls the distance, he make, takes these little short steps backwards and to make you fall short and walk you onto a punch. And yeah, his judgment of distance was the main thing that stood out for me and was really impressive. So those two things I definitely took away from that fight and, and been working on myself. So to clarify, like he's the type of guy where if I throw a punch, I'm going to miss right from the distance of my computer screen to camera and then he'll be able to catch me. But it's going to be like a, a very short distance he's making you miss by, right? Yeah, that's right. He'll make you fall short by you know, one inch and, and then walk you on to a, you know, a solid shot him that he himself. So that's why he, he, he's so dangerous and he forces his, his opponent to second guess themselves and, and um, hesitate because they, they feel like when they punch, they're going to fall short and, and walk onto something. Yeah. Doubt is a fighter's worst enemy. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, with me, I'll give my observation. You'll be like, well, that's so remedial and basic. And I'll go, well, that's what I'm in the business of is he's to me, he has timing. Like that's just what stands out to him. And maybe that's what you're saying, but it's just, it almost feels like it's God given timing where it's like, you couldn't even teach a fighter to throw in those combinations. And that's what stood out to me about him. Yeah. No, you're right. He has excellent timing, control of distance and speed. And obviously the power comes with that speed and that's what makes him a very dangerous fighter. Okay. Well, when it's all said and done, what do you want people to say about your career? That I gave it everything I had. I was a complete professional and I didn't duck and dodge anyone. I took on the best and ultimately my, my biggest goal is to go down as the best Australian fighter of all time. But I've got a long way to go before that. So I'm going to keep working. Who is the guy you're chasing right now, in your opinion, as the best Australian? Um, I think 
Jeff Fennick is probably regarded as the, the best Australian of all time by most people. Um, and yeah, I'd have to agree with that. And he was a three weight uh, world champion, I believe. He should be four, I think most people consider. Um, so yeah, I've got a long way to go, but that's my goal. Okay, well, I really appreciate you taking time to talk with me and I hope you have a very good, uh, boring, safe, restful quarantine <laughs> day 